the nervous system is the most potent place for change. Dysregulation is being stuck in a state and not having access to all the other states. We should be able to move between them. Essentially, what I would call trauma. Trauma is the residual effect in the nervous system. And a lot of times that residual effect is being stuck in a nervous system state you can't get out of. And the reason you're there is because your body still is trying to survive something that it thinks you're still in. Because you didn't have whatever resources were necessary when you had an experience in order to process that. Our society is so motivating. There's so much hustle culture and productivity culture. Always active and always doing and always achieving. But when it's used to excess, then, then we reach burnout and overwhelm and chronic fatigue and chronic pain. We have to develop the skill and the muscle of shifting between nervous system states. Hey there guys, welcome to this week's video. This is a profound conversation about the nervous system and deeply talking about polyvagal theory and unpacking that to really understand what it means to be dysregulated and what it means to have really good nervous system regulation. I guess once you've been in health and wellness for enough time, the conversation will eventually boil down to your nervous system. Many of us are walking around in compromised states where we're consistently in fight or flight or we're in shutdown dorsal vagal nerve functioning system um, and we're not in the ventral. Now, if that doesn't mean much to you, check out this episode. It really will. If there's things like burnout, fatigue, chronic pain, a whole myriad of symptoms strive from poor nervous system function. It is, in my humble opinion, the bedrock of your wellness and well-being. Learning to modulate and come in and out of nervous system states really well is a, fu is a fundamental function indicating that you are in a good health and wellness state. If you can't do that, and generally some we unpack the conversation around trauma in this conversation as well, you know, traumas actually lock us into certain nervous states. We continue to try and function to the best of our ability, but we're coming from a compromised place. This is an incredibly rich conversation. I have to say this conversation was probably about three years in the making. I've been following Suki's work for a long time um, and finally got her on the podcast and I'm really excited to share this episode with you. So yeah, let me know how this goes for you in the comments section below. Let me know what you're walking away from this, but truly this conversation, I guarantee you is going to be a game changer for your health. Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution. And we have with us today, regulating our evolution, Suki Baxter. Suki, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? I am so good. I will have to admit that actually today is the very first time in six years. I've had a few moments where I've gone to do the intro of the podcast, which is like, yow! And thought about it and gone, oh, this is going to be awkward. Like this person I'm sitting opposite is like in their 80s, they're British, they've got different sensibilities and this is a bit, I'm not sure if I should be doing this. And I still go ahead and plow ahead and do that. But today in particular, I was like, oh, this was the closest I ever came to not doing the intro. <laughs> Why? I'm curious why. Yeah, because having followed your work, um, Whole Body Revolution on YouTube for this long, I I know just how much attention and energy goes in at your end to not just create content that helps us regulate our nervous systems. That's how I came across your work, but also, yeah, just how much you embody um, the practice of okay, like this is what regulated can feel like it's you know steady controlled centered and then I'm like oh I'm gonna I, I have the, <laughs> I guess I got some judgments on the you when, <laughs> when I started to interface with your work because I was like this is just like jacking people up <laughs> but maybe oh it's okay because it's social <laughs> that's perfect we can have a conversation about that there's some really <laughs> juicy stuff in there yeah tell me let's just dive straight off into there but for two secs yeah. for guys tuning into Suki for the first time She's an embodiment coach, but that really doesn't do her justice. She's got 15 years of experience working with clients, helping them release pain and trauma from their bodies and, as she likes to say, from her hearts. Um, she's got multiple courses online helping people basically 
the way I would put it is regulate their nervous system so that they can actually live something that is much more aligned with their happiness, their health, and the future of, you know, just a much more successful future for themselves. Um, I'm a massive fan of your work. I'm a bit starstruck, like I told you today, um, to have you here, Suki. But yeah, thank you so much for doing this with us. And I'm really excited for today's conversation about the mind-body connection and nervous system regulation and why it's so important. So yeah. Tell me a little bit about the you and what your thoughts were. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for the intro. Um, I, you said that so well. <laughs> um, no, it, the the regulation piece is so interesting because I think that gets misconstrued a lot as uh, being calm. And so many of us are so anxious. And I speak to anxiety a lot. I've had a lot of anxiety in my life. That's really, that was my portal into this work myself. Um, and so when we're anxious, we want to be calm because we're not calm and we can't access it. But actually, regulation is not calm. Those are not the same things. Being regulated means that you have access to all of the nervous system states because we need all of them. You actually don't want to be calm when you have a predator in front of you. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. if, if you are uh, on the Serengeti somewhere and there is a giant cat coming to get you, you don't want to be totally chill. And tranquil, you actually want to mount that sympathetic survival response because you actually need to preserve your life. We need that mobilizing response. And there's lots of much more subtle examples, right? So we need some nervous system arousal for so for basic things like waking up in the morning, for motivating us to get up and eat, um, for finding a partner, for, for socializing with community, right? The sympathetic nervous system does a, a lot of things. It's a mobilizing response. We want to access it. We just don't want to be stuck there. And unfortunately, what happens to so many of us is that we just live perpetually in our sympathetic nervous system. All of our movement is rooted in our sympathetic nervous system. Um, It's our habitual state of being. And then that's what leads to a lot of the emotional issues that we deal with. So chronic anxiety, sometimes depression as well. Um, You know, fear, worry, concern, uh, catastrophizing, all of those things, but also a lot of health issues. So, um, and the, the list of health issues that falls under nervous system dysregulation is very wide and varied. Um, but, you know, you can start to have panic attacks, you can have insomnia, you can have, um, you know, everything from autoimmune conditions to heart conditions to, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, it, it all kind of traces back to nervous system dysregulation. But that dysregulation isn't necessarily being activated all the time, or it can be being activated all the time dysregulation is being stuck in a state and not having access to all the other states fluidly. We should be able to move between them. Mm -hmm. Which actually one of the things that brought me to your work was chronic pain, Um, chronic tension, I would actually say more so than chronic pain, but maybe they're not too different. Um, But just holding tension patterns in my body that were really like, just, I couldn't like, I foam rolled, I stretched, I physioed, I manipulated. And I do, want to turn this podcast a little bit today into a bit of a masterclass for, um, yeah, just nervous system, like, and understanding that. So I'm fully following what you're saying when you're saying nervous system, um, like the sympathetic nervous system where we're stuck in fight or flight. But maybe we start with you explaining, um, maybe we start at the top with polyvagal theory a little bit, and you can tell us a little bit about what the polyvagal theory is, and then we can dive into the different branches because they're being poly and vagal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I use polyvagal theory as a lens for my work. It's a framework. Um, It is a theory that was developed by Stephen Porges. And basically, it is a framework for the stress response that our bodies are able to mount. Um, And polyvagal, the word itself means poly, many. Vagal relates to the vagus nerve, which is one of the largest nerves in the body. It wanders from your cranium all the way down through your neck, torso, down into your pelvis, um, and it, it connects to a lot of organs and innervates many, many things. Yeah, it's like it's an also upside down Christmas main... tree, right? When I look at the um, when I look at how big it is in your body, when I look at just images, sorry, I've interrupted images online. It's like no, it's actually fine. quite an extensive network that is, lives, yeah, like, yeah. like you said, from your cranium down. Yeah, exactly. And so um, what Stephen Porges identified is that there is a ventral, meaning front, forward, right? Ventral meaning anterior, forward branch of the vagus nerve. And then there's a dorsal, like a dorsal fin, meaning the rear branch of the vagus nerve. Um, and that these, these functions or the functions of these two different 
branches of the vagus nerve are slightly different. So the dorsal vagal branch is kind of like a break. It's uh, energy conservation, it's immobilizing. You can think of it as like the playing possum branch. It tends to slow things down. Um, it can be related to states of like lethargy or depression, collapse, conservation of energy, basically. Uh, the ventral vagal branch is a newer branch and it is related to social engagement. So the ability to connect to our community, to be present with our community. Um, and when, when we're in what he calls ventral vagal social engagement, that is also where we get all the good stuff from life. That is where we get uh, feelings of connection, feelings of purpose, feelings of, you know, um, just being alive, a desire, hope, you know, all, all of the lovely things that we talk about when we're talking about like growth and evolution live in the ventral vagal state. Um, polyvagal theory is pretty interesting. Um, there's a lot of conversation around it right now as to like exactly how these things function, you know, what exactly is active and when. For the work that I do, I find that it is a very helpful framework to look at the three states that Porges identifies. So we talked about dorsal vagal, which is the shutdown state, and ventral vagal, which is the social engagement state. And there's also the sympathetic activation, which I've mentioned already being the fight or flight state. Um, and that is um, not related to the vagus nerve. That's a different branch, uh, different network of nerves in your body. So it used to be that we talked about stress in very binary terms. You were either in your sympathetic fight or flight, or you were in your rest and digest parasympathetic. So polyvagal theory gives us a little bit more of a nuanced framework for looking at stress. And we can look at these things as modulating one another, right? So we can have sympathetic mobilizing activation that is modulated by that ventral vagal, meaning we can be playing soccer with our friends and we're very activated in terms of like, yeah, we wanna go and we wanna get the goal, but we're not actually feeling like we're in danger. It's healthy competition. Um, it's play. And, and those are states that we also want to be able to access, right? So we get the mobilizing of the fight or flight, but we get the calm happiness of that social engagement. <clears throat> um, you can also have mobilizing that is modulated by the dorsal vagal, which is really common. I find this a lot in working with people. And that is where we're very, very activated. And then we're so activated for so long that as a survival response, our bodies come in and they apply that dorsal vagal um, uh, it's like an emergency brake, right? So it's almost like driving with the gas pedal down and then the brake down. So it's not that we took our foot off the gas, it's that we've got both going at the same time. And basically that dorsal vagal is covering up a sympathetic response. So that's where I find people who flip between like anxiety and lethargy quite a bit, or when you start to take that dorsal vagal break off, they find that it's, they just feel super anxious or have a panic attack or they can't sleep. Um, and they have all of the symptoms related to sympathetic activation. So we can kind of use polyvagal theory as a way to look at what we're observing clinically um, when we have someone in front of us or when we're working with our own nervous systems and we're feeling these things. We can be like, okay, this, this is what may be happening in our body. Yeah, I love that. And when I first came to your work, I guess, I and there's probably parts of me in my life even now where I can feel that I've got like the dorsal vagal nerve is like kind of where I'm sort of I've, I'm spending more time I like in there than I ideally would have looked like would love to but I guess also coming to your work it gives you the space to recognize actually it's not about like you said earlier not to just be in that social engagement joy and play it's actually a healthy nervous system is able to like dive in and out between the different states as required how does how do we end up like i don't want to say trapped but how do we end up somewhat stuck in these nervous state systems um yeah am i articulating my question correctly yeah absolutely so like why do, why do we get fixed in one and, and lose access to all of the other ones um for a number of reasons i mean that getting fixed into a nervous system state is essentially what I would call trauma, although that word is so loaded and so very prevalent right now <laughs> that I use it with a lot of caution um, because a lot of people have put a lot of meaning onto what, what is trauma. Uh, but essentially trauma is the residual effect in the nervous system. And a lot of times that residual effect is being stuck in a nervous system state that you can't get out of. And the reason you're there is because your body still is trying to survive something that it thinks you're still in because you didn't have whatever resources were necessary when you had an experience in order to process that. 
And there's different kinds of trauma that happen to people, right? So there's like, we think of trauma a lot of times like shock trauma. So going to war, or being in an accident or injury, something sudden that happens that we call trauma, um, an incident, a single incident of abuse, right? So like one thing that we can point to. But so many of us actually have relational trauma, which is um, we grew up in a society that doesn't have strong community. We may have grown up with caregivers who had their own patterns of nervous system dysregulation and weren't really able to um, tend and attend to our nervous systems in the way that infants and young children need. So when we're born, we don't have the, the ability to self-regulate our nervous system. We need to co-regulate, meaning we need to almost like ting off of somebody else who knows how to do that. And if our caregivers don't know how to do that because they probably didn't get it from their caregivers and so on and so forth, um, it, due to no fault of their own, we then develop relational trauma uh, because they weren't available emotionally for us. And then that can result in trauma patterns, even though nobody had ill intentions. I mean, it may that there can be ill intentions, but a lot of times there were no ill intentions. The parents loved the children or the caregivers loved the children. Um, they just didn't know how to do that. Or we just live in a very contrived, you know, Western society where there's a lot of toxic individualism and not a lot of community. And so we don't get the sort of regulation that we would naturally get being in like small tight knit groups that humans um, naturally evolve to live in. Um, and so those nervous system states um, can then become habitual, right? So we, we enter into like a sympathetic state. Maybe if we have a caregiver who um, flies off the handle a lot, we might be on high alert all the time, like watching for the signs and the symptoms of like, how can I help this caregiver not fly off the handle? What can I do to tend to their nervous system so I don't get in trouble and, and then have the ill effects of this person who doesn't have their own emotional regulation? So then sympathetic becomes our default way of operating. We just don't know how to get back to that parasympathetic or we've never learned because we didn't have it modeled for us. Um, so then we kind of have to, it's, it's almost like going to the nervous system gym and then it's like, okay, we have to develop the skill and the muscle of shifting between nervous system states. Most often, I find that people need to shift to out of sympathetic. It's not always the case, but just because our society is so motivating, there's so much hustle culture and productivity culture and so much impetus to be like, always active and always doing and always drive. achieving. There's just so um, much drive everywhere you turn. Yeah. 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 And that's all sympathetic. And it's not, again, it's not wrong, right? Because that's also what uh, inspires us to grow and to evolve and to explore our potential and to find fulfillment and connection. But when it's used to excess, then, then we reach burnout and overwhelm and chronic fatigue and like you said, chronic pain. There's a point there where you've talked about stress a few times and often when I come back to your videos, I continuously have this realization that stress is not actually what's happening to me. It's what's actually happening in my body. And I realized that further to the point that you were making earlier that even just, and I appreciate you using the word trauma with, you know, and heavily caveating it because of how much weight society bears on it at the moment, but even just how our technology as bodies is quite ancient, right? And then the world that we're living in is quite new, relatively speaking, and even just driving down a street with so many different coloured buildings, <laughs> right, and so many square angles in our day-to-day -day lives. Like we live in boxes and yet, you know, I can tell when I go for a long walk in nature, things start to sort of change in my system. My thinking becomes clearer. And it always is this piece where I come to your work where it's like, yep, stress is, it's, it's generally not the external as much as it is like stress is an internal function. Um, there are stress ores in my environment, but the stress itself is actually my internal, like what's going on inside. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit for us real quick, Dick, before I ask my next question? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's perfectly said. And that's what I was going to say is there's a difference between stressors and stress, right? So there are things that apply stress to us. And then there's the process that happens within us. Um, and I think that dealing with stress is twofold. So you know, we can talk about stress management and really the way that I look at that from a nervous system standpoint is that we want to develop the capacity to handle the things that come up in life without decompensating. 
So that's called uh, widening the window of tolerance. And your window of tolerance is the zone within which you have resources to deal with what comes at you. Um, and and th these things can stack, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be that there's a huge thing that happens to you, but there could be 25 small things and mm. the 26th thing sends you outside your window of tolerance, Spore right? So <laughs> again, exactly, exactly. And so just again, like the... Um, you know, like the analogy of going to the gym, we want to develop our nervous system resilience so that we can handle the things that come at us in life. And a lot of this is repatterning the things that we didn't get when we were children, right? We didn't get these co-regulation skills. We didn't get nervous system regulation skills. None of us got it in school, I, I would imagine, unless you're one of the very lucky few who goes to things like forest schools, you know, and, mm. or wilderness schools. But those Those are very different. But like if you went to a traditional uh, school where you sit at a desk and you're asked to focus for, you know, a period of time and you get like 20 minutes of recess twice a day to run around, um, you you probably didn't get emotional regulation and nervous system regulation skills in school. Um, so we want to develop that. But I think at the same time, there's a real problem in the Western culture of putting the onus of change on the individual, right? And saying, um, if you are if you are having trouble in the world, then you need to go work on yourself and fix yourself. Um, and then, you know, then everything will be fine. But that, that's, it doesn't work that way because a lot of the way that we're living right now is so artificial. And so our nervous systems, like you said, are ancient <laughs> and they're very well designed for dealing with the natural world. They are not very well designed for dealing with even being in a car moving at speed, much less all of the other things that are happening. You've got phones pinging and you're drinking coffee and, you know, lights and buildings and sirens and, people shouting and whatever else that might be going on, that's a lot for a nervous system to handle. Um, and so I think it's really important to have a lot of compassion for the fact that if we lived in a different kind of world with a different way of life, um, that, that a lot of what we experience may be either not there or greatly diminished simply because we would be more in relationship with nature. We would be more in relationship with community. We would have far less stimulation coming at us constantly. So it's kind of twofold. You, you can only do what you can do and you can only work on yourself. And at the same time, we have to recognize that we are products of our environment and our environment is influencing us all the time. I'm smiling because I'm remembering back to somewhere in my research <laughs> this podcast. I remember you saying nervous system regulation is activism. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it uh, ten thousand percent is. It really is. And I, just as a personal note, like I find it really interesting the things that are coming up for me in terms of um, how I'm seeing the world, and you know, as my nervous system becomes more regulated, and the things that I'm like, this feels odd. Like I constantly have this hang up about one silly thing, which is um, I live in a neighborhood, I have neighbors and I'm really hung up on the idea of owning a lawnmower because I'm like, everyone owns one. They all use it for like 10 minutes, twice a week, maybe. And then it sits in the garage, but everyone has to buy one. It just, and, and I mean, the, the lawnmower stands in for a lot of things, but it's just, it's such a, it's such a great example of like, it's such an odd thing to me that, you know, every single house has to be solely, it has to be its own little completely equipped capsule. But then right next door is another completely well equipped. Stand alone. Yeah. When, yeah. 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 And like, and, but we're, we're all living in these little capsules and there's not this sense of like interwoven community mm. that's, that's happening. And I know that that is different depending on where people live, but in the United States, it's really common. It's more the norm than the exception. Yeah. Absolutely. I think so too. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I find myself in my coaching sometimes saying this, which, yeah, which is with backgrounds in NLP and stuff like that. I, I try to keep everything as empowering as possible and, you know, but with qualifying that we're trying to be as grounded as possible as well. So not sort of overreach into, you know, something that is masking anything. But um, I find myself saying, because people are quite hard on themselves and you mentioned the word compassion. I just wanted to sort of pepper this in there because, you know, sometimes I find myself saying is like, did you even stand a chance? Um, and people go, what? Like, you're inspired evolution, like, you know, inspired me more. I was like, yeah, but just, just pause for a sec. Like, 
did you stand a chance, right? Like you walk down the supermarket aisle, like this is just, you know, let's just call it vanity fair for a sec, but like you're walking down the supermarket aisle, you're just trying to buy toothpaste and there's all these creams and lotions with all these airbrushed people that look absolutely perfect on their covers pouring in on you. It's all fluorescent lighting. It's and you walk and you're just like, okay, this is what I should be looking like as I brush my, grab what I need to brush my teeth. You walk out. I remember looking when I used to live in the city, in the heart of the city of Melbourne, was this massive two billboards for like we have a brand here called Bonds. I'm not sure if it's made its way around the world or not, but it's like underwear, right? Um, and there's this mass, like there's this dude with a six pack and there's this chick in her bikini and these billboards are huge, like massive, right? And I'm looking at them and I'm like, you know, there's probably four people in this one kilometer radius that actually look like that, but everybody walks past this every mm-hmm. single day. Mm-hmm. And that is just like bombarding them with like this is the standard that you need to be of like you know society and like just to sell you something. Mm-hmm. And I just from that point, people and I was like, with all this stuff coming your way, and now in this conversation, I'd probably put it as all this stuff aimed at potentially hijacking your senses, dysregulating you in some way. Did you stand a chance? You know. Um, from not feeling good enough, you know, being so hard on yourself, having such high expectations and judging yourself so hard. Um, Yeah, I find that it's an important conversation to have just to sort of start to recognise that actually you are pretty whole, but the external stimuluses can be quite triggering. Absolutely. And if you look at this from the nervous system uh, standpoint, you know, whether it's intentional or not, and I, I don't know how intentional it is, but we are with you in that camp. (laughs) Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, we are actively conditioned away from living in our bodies, right? And and I think some of this is just culture. I mean, if you if you dig into, there's a really great book um, called Intelligence in the Flesh uh, by Guy Claxton. Uh, I really like it. He talks about the history of our body-mind separation and the fact that it started with like, it was the soul and the body and uh, the soul belonged to the church. And then, you know, the doctors and the anatomy people were, um, were granted, you know, sort of permission by the church to be like, okay, you can like dissect these bodies and stuff, but the soul belongs to us. And then as we've become, um, you know, less collectively of the same faith, the and that has been more like private then collectively we've replaced soul with intellect right so our our our, we think the mind is this exalted thing that is you know so different from the body Um, and so i think that that infuses itself into the way that we do everything and if you just look at school i mean i i i was particularly miserable in school um was one of those kids who just like i would cry before i went to school every day i did not like it i did not enjoy it it was really hard um and it's no wonder because you know children need to move and it's neuroscience that children need to move in order to stimulate growth of their brains in order to learn like those things need to be together but we we actively condition kids away from being in their body at all you know when they feel agitated and um like they want to get up and jump around, we label them as bad and misbehaving. You know, we say that you're good when you're sitting still and paying attention and you're quiet. Um, You have to ask permission to do basic things like go to the bathroom or eat food or, you know, those things are relegated to certain times. So no one ever says, are you hungry? You know, I mean, it's not that we're never asked that, but no one's, no one ever really teaches us like, are you hungry? Check in. Yes. No. And like, let's eat when we're actually hungry. It's no lunchtime is from this time to this time. And then you have recess from this time to this time. It's never following the internal urges. So we're very divorced from our internal guidance system. And then what I think is really fascinating um, is that when we don't, when we're numb to ourselves and you can look at like Oliver Berkman, who was a um, neurologist. And then we look at like pain science with um, amputees. When you can't feel yourself, your your brain interprets that as a very dangerous state. So that's why amputees get that phantom limb pain. They can't feel it uh, because it's not there. There's nothing to feel. And so the brain's like, I can't find this arm that used to be there 
so I'm going to, I'm going to sound the alarm and the alarm is pain. So you start to feel pain in something that doesn't exist. There's nothing there to feel pain, but your brain is mapping that area that does not exist with pain. Um, so if you think about like, okay, we're not actually amputated from our bodies, but if we're metaphorically amputated from our bodies and we can't feel anything, then we're in constant emotional pain. Mm. And then from that state, and we're, and we're activated, right? We're in a sympathetic state. We're in a survival state. We will do anything to resolve that, which means that we're open to being sold anything. We're open to being sold. Your body should look like this. You know, you should buy this pair of underwear. You should buy this kind of toothpaste. You should get your teeth whitened. You should get these earrings or just, I mean, like it, the list is infinite. And it's not just stuff. We can be sold ideas too, right? Like if you buy into this ideology, like this will... Um, this will solve that agitation. And so I think it's a very interesting thing to look at kind of if you back away from culture and society at large and be like, wow, we're really amputated from ourselves. And we're also in a really like we're in a, a state where people are fighting a lot. And I think that if we had more internal connection, we would have more connection to one another and there'd be um, more peace. More harmony for sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for, for elaborating on that. Okay. Bringing it, Back to the body, because I'm conscious um, people tuning in are going to at some point know, so what do I do? <laughs> and um, just to make it hyper practical for you guys, I, um, yeah, one of the things that brought me to that, well, uh, not just brought me to, okay, so what brought me to Suki's work, let's start there, is constant neck tension, neck and traps, always tense, upper back, always tense, foam rolling all the time, stretching all the time, um, child's poses all the time, trying to relieve the tension and being thoroughly unable to do so. And you mentioned it a few times in your videos again and again, Suki, which is if it come, feels like when you're coming back to your stretch every time for the first time, <laughs> potentially something's up in your nervous system. Um, and that resonated really deeply for me. That was kind of the hook that sort of landed me into your work. Um, and then the pain-free body came across me and it was like, ah, okay, this is really interesting. Um, I am burning the candle at both ends and this is where my body is sort of cinching up around things. And even from there, like simple bits of awareness, like lying flat on the floor, with my arms splayed out and going, okay, give yourself to the earth. I like just in a mean, like physically gravity, gravity, right. And then watching my fingers just like sticking up in the air and going, Hey, <laughs> like flatten. And it's like, Oh, that's actually requiring engagement rather than relaxation. What the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Can you start to explain a little bit around, well, what's in my mind is tension is consciousness, which, yeah, it oh, sounds like really that. intense, <laughs> but can you expand a little bit on what is going on there, please? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, I love that you say tension is consciousness because it totally is. Um, so if if we were to put you under anesthesia, you'd become quite floppy, right? Like we, we could move you around. Your tension would go away, essentially, because your your brain is offline so, you, so i think and there's been experiments um, of that right like literally they've put people under and they're able to physically manipulate their limbs right. into positions which are like quite flexible one would say yeah. or mobile um whichever word you want to use but then they come back and then they don't actually have that range of mobility Exactly. Right. And it's different from when you're asleep because people assume that when they're asleep, the tension would go away, but your brain is still online when you're asleep. Like, and I don't, I don't understand exactly the physiological process of anesthesia, but it does something. I mean, I think it's like a very, a very low grade form of dying. If I understand it correctly, it scares me. Um, but it does something to your nervous system to kind of take it offline in a way that sleep does not. Right. So people who have habituated tension still have a lot of that habituated tension, even when they're asleep, um, which is why if you take your pillow away, if you sleep with a pillow and you take your pillow away and then your head is at an angle, you're stretching those muscles and you wake up, you're like, oh, I slept funny because you were sleeping at an angle that your physical tension, that your nervous system didn't allow. And I want to back that up just a little bit because I think that people often don't know what a tight muscle actually is. And so, yes, a tight muscle can be thick tissue, 
but really when we're talking about what tension is, it's, it's a contraction in the muscle and a contraction in the muscle only happens when your nervous system, when your brain, and your nervous system, tell that muscle to squeeze and contract, right? So that tight muscle is not a rubber band that is too short. It is your brain telling the muscle to be tight. So that's where we're talking about like tension is consciousness. So it's, it's, um, the tension in your body is the physical manifestation of your internal state, right? And then, then people want to go into, well, I can think my way out of it. Well, maybe, I mean, you can certainly think some thoughts and then you'll find that you relax a little bit, but your state of mind is not just your conscious thought. Your state of mind is also the sensory information that is coming in from your body. So if you have chronic tension and some muscles that are chronically tight are not like you can't, it's very hard to consciously say, I'm going to relax my psoas right now. Like it's, it's, it's hard to know where that is, right? Like I can relax my shoulders, but if I'm like, relax my psoas, I'm kind of like, oh, I kind of know where it is, but that's a much <laughs> different thing, right? So, so we can influence your brain by shifting the tension levels, decreasing the tension, which then tells your brain, hey, actually I'm safe here. Like that tension is telling me I'm not safe. There's something to be concerned about. But if I shift that tension level, then my brain gets a different message, which then influences my state of mind, which can then influence your ability to think positive thoughts as well. Right. So if anyone's tried positive thinking, this was this was my experience with it. I would, you know, I'd be like, I'm not upset. I'm not anxious. It's fine. Everything's fine. I mean, I was, you know, more complicated than that. But then there's like this internal voice that's like, Oh shit. You're yeah, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like I can clearly feel that, that that I am anxious. Um and so when you shift your tension, you shift your posture, your posture then sends a different message to your brain, your sensory information. So what you're able to tap into communicates upward into your nervous system and your brain kind of goes new information and the readout is like I am safe here, which is you know, that's when we downregulate things like pain and stress and anxiety and all of the things that most people are trying to get rid of or move away from. Would you say that's the primary focus of a lot of your work at its core is helping people feel safe again in their bodies? Absolutely. That's, that's it. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate what you're saying because oftentimes I've found in myself trying to positive, like positively affirm my way through a situation and then recognizing it's, it's almost like, and I can see myself giving the example here of like being hunched over and I'm like, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. But my posture's like this and it's like, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. <laughs> Even like the way I feel is a bit gollumy when I'm saying that I'm happy. <laughs> you know, and It's like giving yeah. yourself the opportunity to actually yeah, recognize that your physical state has a lot to do with your mental state. In fact, you know, when I start diving into your work, it's they are one and the same in many ways. And, you know, just to sort of embellish, because we didn't really cross um, the voyage of getting your backstory in this episode thus far, and we're already quite a ways into it, but, you know, you've got a background with, I think it was structural integration. I, I, I recognize it as, as rolfing where you're like, you know, my experience of rolfing was you beat up the muscles pretty hardcore <laughs> to try and get them to lengthen out. And then, you know, still they're not like lengthening like you described earlier. And it's like, actually, I love that awareness that you shared with us, which is the muscles like an elastic band and actually your mind's in contraction, hence the muscles in contraction and learning that, you know, these habituated patterns of the nervous systems are like nervous systems are like actually what's holding us in place in that mind but also if we can tap in deeper and I feel like does it get more fundamental than the nervous system in your awareness to try and impact change for posture and mental posture I'll call it that for now um yeah does it get more deeper than that or is that the best place to sort of really connect to it because it's what I've come across in your work but maybe yeah no I I think that's a good question I mean for what I understand right now and I mean this work is I feel like I'm a beginner in it every day. Like I, I never know like yeah. what I, I don't know. I love that about right? your like, vibe, by the way. I'm so <laughs> sorry to interject, but I love that about your vibe. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, because I mean, you know, I learned something new. I'm like, whoa, that just fills in so many new pieces. Uh, but for what I understand right now, the nervous system is the most potent place for change. And what I love about working with the nervous system is 
that it is universal. So like it, it crosses species. So a lot of what I've learned about the nervous system has been affirmed through my work with horses. And I've got two of my own. Um, I also have done body work on horses. Um, and they they really were grounding this material for me. So like I would I was doing the work professionally with human clients and kind of coming to these conclusions with the nervous system. And then I would go work with horses and I'm like, it's the same. It's you know, and I was able to affect change. Now humans and horses are slightly different. <laughs> um but the principles were the same. The principles for recognizing like a horse with tense, anxious posture, you know, you can say, okay, that horse is feeling, you, you surmise that this horse is feeling anxious and you know you're right because you probably get a response like a horse bolting or bucking or rearing or having some sort of like what might be called a behavioral issue, but really is an expression of fear or anxiety. But you can see that in their posture. You can see that in their eye. You can see it in the tension of their body. And then you do something, whether it's a movement practice for the horse or some hands-on body work for the horse, to affect their posture and their tension levels and the behavior of the horse changes, right? So, well, what is that? Well, that's the nervous system and we're working at a biological level. We're not having a conversation. We're not coaching the horse, right? Which is another very powerful place for change. But of course, we can't have that conversation with horses because they don't have the capacity for human language. So... The nervous system is a really fundamental and foundational place to work, and it's not symptomatic. That's the other thing that I like about it. So um, rather than being like, okay, you have pain, let's address the pain, and you have autoimmune conditions, let's address the autoimmune conditions, and you have um, anxiety, let's address the anxiety, we can give all the people the same you know, the same fundamental principles and say, we're not going to address yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. and not even prescription, but the like way forward. Yeah, right. Nice. And, and, <laughs> but, but the same kind of path, the same tools, the same resources and say like, let's apply these principles and, and like, we won't worry about the symptoms that each one of you is experiencing. We're just going to do this experiment. We're going to apply these principles. We're going to see what happens overall to all of the symptoms. And because those are all linked to nervous system dysregulation, it's often that those things improve when the nervous system becomes more regulated and discharges stored stress and trauma. So I like the nervous system because of those reasons. I also like it because it's very tangible. I'm a Taurus. I like things I can see and touch. Um, I, I have a very deep spiritual side. I love energy work. I think it's great. I just get frustrated by it because I just feel like I don't have a lot of... Um, I don't feel like I can make the results consistent, right? But like with nervous system work, there's there's pretty clear like this is working or this is not working. There's clear indicators of like that's better, that's less tension, that's more tension, right? right? That symptom got better, that symptom got worse. Like we, it, it's very good at pointing you towards what's working and what's not working for the person. Cool. I feel like we've covered quite a bit of ground on the principles, but if there's maybe something more there to um... – share like how what are some of the principles that help us move forward in this space to a better better place um and if you feel like we've covered that ground my next question is going to be what are some of the practices yeah yeah well i think those are good questions to pair together because practices are essentially neutral right so uh, people always want to know what to do which is important we need the container practices provide the container for us to have an experience but it's like 20 percent 80% is how you're doing and how you're approaching the practice. People move all the time. People go to yoga, they work out, they skate, they swim, they ride horses, and they don't necessarily have resolution of stress and trauma uh, because of it. they're doing it from the same habitual place they've always done it, and they're maybe not attending to things, right? Can I just jump in there for one sec? There's of course. There's a video that you put out in the world, which when I watched it rubbed me up the wrong way, but it was so healthy for me to receive, and I'm going to be vulnerable and share it. I like there is like there is a competitive drive in Amrit. Like there is just that's just one of the things that I have as my my makeup. And uh you called it out hardcore. And at the time when I was like, oh, no, no, this is like singing <laughs> when it was even going to yoga and watching somebody else be able to do a pose um with greater flexibility and just how the competitive drive within like an individual can get triggered. And it's like, oh yeah, I like I'm gonna, you know try and be more flexible and actually that is in some ways the antithesis of yoga because yoga is being one with yourself and where you're at 
and meeting yourself and so even and this sort of I think I just wanted to interject that in there because it makes a point to what you're trying to say which is and it was practical for me very frustrating to hear (laughs) the first time I heard you say that though um but yeah like you're you can be doing things a certain way but actually um yeah, the, the principles and the practices go together. Please, sorry, I've interrupted. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's such a great point because I think a lot of times bod- embodiment gets conflated as like the thing that you're doing, right? So like you see somebody doing some crazy, amazing yoga pose. And I mean, all the credit to them because that is hard. Um, and I'm sure it took a lot of work for someone to get to that point, but that doesn't necessarily mean that person is embodied. Um, embodiment is the internal experience that you're having while doing a thing, not the thing that you're doing. Right. And so um, when it comes down to some of the principles, like the number one principle is attention, right? Having an attention on what you're doing, being able to notice the sensory experience Um, with the small asterisk that, that if you have stored trauma in your body, attending to your internal sensory experience can be triggering. Um, at first. So there's kind of a process there. And and generally, we want to start with the environment and then kind of move towards the body and and kind of get to the skin and then start to come internally um, and do that progressively so that we know, like, where is that threshold? Like, you know, where, how close can my attention get to me before I start feeling anxious or before I start noticing things I don't want to notice? Um, But attention while you're doing any practice is really, really important, attending to what you're experiencing. Attention is how, it's what triggers neuroplasticity. So it's how your brain rewires. Um, So after age 25, you know, your brain doesn't passively rewire. When you're really young, you know, you're just like passively like plastic, like everything that comes into your universe, you're like, yes, I will change, uh, which is good and bad. (laughs) Um, But after age 25, you, you, you still have neuroplasticity, you just have to have a lot of attention, and then you have to have intention, right? So like, what am I trying to achieve here? What am I trying to get to? So those are two really important principles. Um, But I think attention is the one that I emphasize the most. And then um, kind of underneath that, that practices are neutral, that what you're doing is not as important as your experience while you are doing the thing. So you can do yoga in a very disembodied way. You can do weightlifting in a very embodied way. It's not what you're doing. Helping us dial into making it, making it, um, experiencing it in a more embodied way. Um, what is the invitation in that space? Um, yeah, I'm tempted not to free, preload your answer because I've got some ideas of my own. Yeah. yeah, no, the question that I like the most is what do you notice? What, what do you notice? And that, I mean, that can be your invitation to yourself in any moment, but it can be a daily invitation. What do I notice right now? What do I notice in my environment? What do I notice in myself? Um, and what you'll, what you'll typically find is that people, when they haven't practiced feeling their bodies, they'll jump into a story, right? So either they'll jump into a story or, the, or they'll tell you everything that hurts. <laughs> so, so a lot of times when, when I would have a client come in and say, well, what, what do you notice? What has your, or the other one is what has your attention right now? right? What has your attention? My back hurts or my hip hurts or you did, did, did. okay, well, that's what hurts. What else? And you can just keep going. What else? What else do I notice? What else do I notice? What else do I notice? That simple practice can start to get you in relationship with your environment and in relationship with yourself. And if you start to look for things that you notice in your physical self that are not painful, that is going to do something very important, which is it's going to start to highlight to your brain something called non-nociceptive sensory input, which simply it's a big word, a big phrase, I guess, but all it means is sensory information. So feelings, sensations in your body that are not dangerous, that tell your brain that you're safe here. So when we're in pain, that tends to stand out to us and then we focus on it. And then that becomes all we notice. And then our brain is only getting this input that like, we're in pain, we're in pain, we're in pain. And then that just increases that threat threshold. And so it sensitizes us even further to the pain, which makes pain worse and worse. So if we can send some non-nociceptive sensory data to the brain, then that just sort of smooths everything out. Your brain's like, oh, actually, it's okay. Yeah, and some that can things actually... do work. <laughs> just focus yeah, on what's working. Like, just go, like some things my do knee work hurts, right. but also, <laughs> My knee hurts, but I'm also breathing and my heart is pumping and like I can talk and I can see and I can smell and I can hear and I have skin everywhere holding all of me together. Like there's a lot that's going right. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm laughing or giggling because 
it's such a simple concept. But I remember the first time I went through that exercise was through one of your exercises in the whole body revolution. And I was just like, oh, yeah, like the mind has this like natural propensity to sort of, oh, that's stuck and that hurts and like that's achy and just focus on what's achy. But it's like, how about your abdomen? And it's like, actually, it feels kind of good. And it's like, just spend some time hanging out there in your mind. <laughs> it's like, but why? And it's like, but why not? <laughs> it's like this whole, like literally a rewiring, like you were describing before, to sort of yeah. spend some time in that space and go, like, actually, oh, yeah. Like I'm not all, like I am a bit of a Mitsubishi rather than a Bitsubishi. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that has so much correlation with anxiety, right? Because like if, you, if you're like, oh, my knee is killing me, and then like, oh, but my abdomen feels fine, like, a lot of times it's like, well, I can't really stay here until I fix, I got to fix this knee thing. I got to fix the knee, you know, like, like that becomes kind of the dry, like I got to fix the knee thing. And I used to see this in clients all the time who'd come in when I was doing body work, they'd come in and they would have whatever list of complaints. Right. And, um, you know, two or three, four things, whatever that were the kind of their primary and usually one or two stands out as like the thing. Um, and you start working with them and you do a few sessions and then like one day, you know, they're coming in, they're complaining about something else. And you look back at your notes and you're like, whatever happened to that SI joint? pain oh I haven't even thought about that in weeks but they they just move you know from pain to pain point and and think about how we do this in life right like oh I got to pay this bill but then I got then I've got this other problem over here and then I've got a relationship challenge and then this family member da, 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 da. like we're always kind of moving our attention from pain point to pain point to pain point and then life just sort of glides on by and we miss the good parts because we're not allowing our attention to rest in the good things in life because we're so focused on, well, I can't do that until I fix all the pain points. But if that's all you're focusing on, they're never going to go away, which is so annoying to a brain that really likes to fix problems. Part of me should just end the podcast there. <laughs> that is like, <laughs> just drop the mic. Yeah. Taking the time to slow down to appreciate. Well, that bleeds in actually to a really good point as well, which is actually slowing down. Now, I know I've got a Chinese acupuncturist and he's always like, slow down. <laughs> he's always telling everybody to slow down. Um, it is also something that is espoused through your work, but I found it it's on the macro, like everybody can be told to slow down and it can be equal parts um, healing and equal parts frustrating as well, <laughs> as well to, to receive. But also let's dial into a couple of like, practices that I've picked up from yourself which have been really useful which is just slow down a pattern of movement that you do like head turning just slow it down for a second see what happens can you extra like expand on what that is rather than me having to talk through something that I've learned from you <laughs> Get it yeah. From that, yeah well so yeah slowing down can be really frustrating particularly if you're in your sympathetic nervous system which wants to go fast and there's nothing I just want to say like as a little aside there's nothing wrong with that right like it's fine to love riding bikes fast or I have horses I ride fast sometimes it's fun it's exhilarating. It's that play. It's that, you know, it's, it's feeling alive. Um, but when it comes to actually embodiment and resolving stress and trauma, um, it comes back to that attention and sensory information. So if you're moving super fast, um, when you're in your sympathetic nervous system, right, you're, you're, you're just bypassing your, your ability to engage your parasympathetic nervous system in the movement. Um, and if you're moving really fast as well, there's not a lot of opportunity for your brain to notice the sensory experience of the movement. So when you move slowly, there's more opportunity in the movement to be aware of it. And then there's also, we're, we're breaking apart a pattern, right? So um, if I snap my head to the side, that's more of a reflex. If I turn slowly and with attention, I'm sending information to my brain, but I'm also creating the potential for like, okay, I could rewire this movement, right? I could, I could notice, oh, actually... I'm kind of like moving my head around my neck. Well, let's let's try moving it a different way. Now I'm creating new neural pathways. So that comes back to neuroplasticity, right? So you're going to get more change from a movement that is slow that you can attend to than you will from one that is rapid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And one of the things you consciously dialed me into um, is the beginnings and the ends of the movements as well being these real... Um, opportunities yeah yeah to really dial that in um, because I think even with the turning head examples like turn your head slowly 
I can still feel from an embodied place that my goal is to still turn my head. I'm very focused on like internally still just turning head and sort of getting to said outcome as opposed to when you're like focus on the beginning and the end of the movement. It's like, turn your head and it's like, and it just, I don't know, for me, it really works that prompt that you had, which is focus on the beginning, focus on the end. Cause when I start to focus on the beginning of the movement, I naturally just slow down into like presence um, in a much richer way. Yeah. Yeah. So I really appreciate yeah. that prompt. Yeah. Yeah. Presence is a good word too. Yeah. There's, um, there's another couple of things in there. So uh, do I start with eyes? Do I start with the ears? Let's start with the ears. So what do the ears have to do here? Like, cause it, you can feel it when you do the exercise stuff changes. So can you describe us some of these practices and why the ears with, yeah, why the ears? What? Huh? Well, so a number of reasons. So you have some direct access to branches, the auricular branches of the vagus nerve um, that are located close to the surface of the ear. So you can kind of contact um, you're not contacting the nerve directly because you're contacting the skin, you know, and the nerve doesn't go through the skin, but you're contacting in the region of the nerve. So you're getting some direct stimulation to the area where the vagus nerve, um, sits in your, in your, you know, in the ear area. And like I said, there's lots of different branches that goes down your neck and into your torso and so on and so forth. Um, but there are branches there, so you can contact that, um, and so that sends information through the vagus nerve. 80% of the fibers of the vagus nerve are sensory, meaning that they travel to the brain, right? So they're, they're bringing information from your body to your brain. Only 20% are going from your brain to your body. So, right. um, yeah. so you, you, you're at, an output. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, which is why I find the body such a powerful, um, handle for change, right? Because you can, you can influence so directly and so in this moment, without having to do that tug of war with yourself and like, you know, that wrestling match of like, I don't feel anxious. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. You know, it's like you can just stimulate the nerve and get this sort of pure information that goes to the brain. Um, there's also, a, there's not a lot of muscle tissue. There's a lot of fascial tissue around your ears. And fascia is very rich in proprioceptors. Fascia is your or, organ of organization. Uh, when you're stimulating fascia, you're sending, again, a lot of information in. You are not breaking up fascia, which is kind of the, that's, I think that's kind of going away, although it still crops up sometimes. I move in nervous system circles. I don't see it as much. Um, but, you know, people talk about like going and getting a massage and like breaking up adhesions or whatever. You can't do that. The research doesn't bear it, bear it out. So um, you're not breaking anything up, but you are sending a lot of sensory information into your brain, again, just through the fascial system. And then if you think about like where your ears are, they're a wonderful handle for all of the fascia that surrounds your head. Um, you've got a bunch of nerves, you know, your brain doesn't, it's not this organ that just sits in there completely apart from anything, this neural matter that you have in your brain condenses down to become your spinal cord, which then exits out the base of your cranium. And so if you can use your ears and kind of release the fascia here, that can influence the muscles around the base of your uh, skull and the top of your neck, which can then create more blood flow, take pressure off of the cranial nerves. I mean, there's just so many things that are impacted um, by the ears. They're connected very closely to your jaw. So when you're working with the, the ears, you can also influence jaw tension. And, you know, what's one thing that everyone notices when they're in sympathetic is like mm -hmm. clenching teeth. So if you yeah. can decrease your jaw tension, <laughs> that's going to send relaxation info to your brain. And there's, there's just so much that gets contacted through this really simple handle of your ears. Um, and I just find it super interesting that sometimes when you like wiggle one ear, you're like, oh, that feels pretty good. And then you go to the other side, and you're like, whoa, oh, that doesn't move. Like that's you know, we can have a lot of tension on one side. So that can be really illuminating. And you can take that in if you have, you know, maybe one shoulder that's really tight. Hmm, you know, there might be a connection there. And if you can use that ear where you have all these um, proprioceptors and all of this very available neural input uh, to create relaxation, that can have cascading effects throughout your body. And the exercises are quite simple. I'll link one of your videos um, that, yeah, just helps um we use the word massage out the ears um but there's probably a better word for massage but yeah massage out the ears um with this awareness that's in a the fine word. <laughs> cool um and then one of the other things that yeah really got me going was um lying down eyes closed 
and use it like I work with your eyes closed. What's going on there? Can you describe that as well? Um, so you're not engaging vision, right? Because your eyes are closed. So you're not actually connecting with your environment, but you are moving the muscles of your eyes. So your eye movement is controlled by muscles, just like everything else is in your body. Um, but if there, if there, if there is stress or trauma in the body, eyes can become fixed in a position and you may notice this. So it's really interesting. Like just start noticing people's eyes when you talk to them, when you're out and about in the world. And you'll see that some people's eyes don't move much. So they've, they're they like really kind of stuck there. And almost, sometimes they even look a, like a little pushed forward um, in the eye socket, right? And so they're, they're not, uh, those muscles are probably pretty tense and pretty rigid the same way that if you had tight hamstrings, they would be tense and rigid. Um, and so you're still stretching those muscles, but you're taking the visual input out of it, right? So you're just doing a stretch without having to have the visual stimulus of connecting outward into the environment. You can do it. uh, You can do it both ways. But when you take the visual input out, um, there's one less variable because when we're looking at something, we have a habitual way of organizing our bodies in relation to that. Mm. we, we don't think about the way that we use our eyes to map the world. And of course, if you're not sighted, this will be different, right? You'll use other senses to do this. But when you're a sighted person, whether you wear glasses or contacts or not, you look at things and then organize your body towards it. That's why when you're driving a car, yes. And that's why when you're driving a car and you look to one side, you start veering yeah. to that side, yeah. right? Yeah. So when you take the visual out of it, you sort of create more openness in the ability for you to then move the muscles of your eyes without your body kind of going into its default. Like this is how I organize in response to Mm. that thing. Any compensatory patterns as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the exercises for me, especially with the eyes were quite profound in terms of just coming what it felt like I was coming back out from deeply I don't want to use the word down regulated again I'm not I'm conscious that you know maybe the terminology is wrong but like down regulated states or states that were yeah like taking the time to just move with my eyes and hold them in certain places and then feeling like my body like softened as a whole um I remember the first few times I did it and I thought it was voodoo, to be honest. <laughs> um, what, like, is that me just focusing now on what's working, um, similar to what you were describing before? Or, well, yeah, there, is a physi- there is a physiological change that happens with your vision when you are in sympathetic and when you're in parasympathetic. So, um, so when you're stretching those muscles, it may change the way that you then see, right? It changes the tension around your eye socket. It changes, it may change the relationship to your eyeball of your eyeball to your eye socket, like where it's sitting in the eye socket. And you may have more peripheral vision when you're in sympathetic nervous system states. Um, you become very focused on an object, much like your camera does in portrait mode, right? So if you have an iPhone and you put it in portrait mode, the, the thing that you focus it on becomes very focused. Everything else blurs out. Um, when you're in parasympathetic, you have access to your peripheral vision. Um, and what can be a really interesting practice uh, is to sit and like pick something and stare at it really hard, or you can just even put your finger out in front of you and stare at your finger really hard and just notice how you feel in your body. Notice the position of your pelvis on the chair. Notice what happens to your breathing. Notice what happens to your jaw. And just be really aware um, for me, it's a, a sense of being very calcified. Like I almost feel like I grow a shell around me. And then if you soften that and you can actually kind of hold your hands out into the periphery or like move your fingers, you know, in the periphery of your vision, um, and really stimulate the peripheral vision, then notice again, okay, how does my pelvis feel now? How does my breathing feel now? How does my jaw feel now? Right. And so um, I don't think it's incorrect to call it a down regulation because for most of us, we are kind of perpetually in sympathetic. So we are down regulating. It's just that regulation isn't always being calm. Mm. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? It does. Yeah, it does. Please back to sort of where we started. So for those that are experiencing 
well, could be anything, anxiety or chronic back pain, um, tight hamstrings. What do you recommend um, for people that are tuning in if they're looking for the next steps from this podcast? Yeah. Um, so I have a free program called Pain Free at Any Age, and that's a really great place to start. Because it's a great it really... title, by the way. <laughs> <Sorry>. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but please. Thank you. Um, and, and and honestly, that comes that comes from my frustration of <laughs> people constantly when I was doing body work for years and years. It didn't matter how old someone was. They're like, well, I'm getting old. And that's why I feel this way. And I mean, I had a client who started a, um, competitive weightlifting at age 70. And I was like, yeah. And, you know, you're 29. I don't think so. <laughs> you know, like, uh, but but from the time I was in my early 20s, when I really didn't have any concept of aging at all, I would hear people say, oh, I'm just getting old. And that's what happens when you get old. Well, it's not necessarily what happens. So when I say pain free at any age, I really mean that like, you, you, getting older is not this sentence of like, you're just going to break down perpetually. Um, but there, that really is a great place to start because it gives you like, step by step, you know, some videos that really explain this theory and how it applies to pain specifically and gives you some practices and some downloads and some worksheets that you can do. Um, I think that's probably the best next step for pain specifically. I would wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. And uh, Suki, where, uh, like your YouTube channel is potentially one of my favorite channels um, on YouTube and that's there's a lot of channels out there on YouTube, um, specifically because of, yeah, the content is, I love it, um, but also just you can tell how much care you've put into creating each video and also, you know, being a content creator, the conversation of like helping people is really present for me, but then also like just being able to figure out, you know, I think people struggle a lot with niche and stuff like that again and again, whereas you seem to have just gone, yep. I get what I'm up to in the world and this is what I'm helping people with. And you know what you're getting when you get there and you're like, and yet it's different every time as well. So it's, it's, yeah, I love it as an incredibly rich portal to just continuously come back to and connect with. Um, yeah. Is it okay to point people to your YouTube um, forward slash Suki Baxter? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And I have to say thank you very much for the positive feedback. That makes me feel really good to hear. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. I love it when people hang out on, on YouTube. So yeah. that's a great place to send people. For those that are tuning into the audio, Suki Baxter is S-U-K-I-E-B-A-X-T-E-R. Um, yeah, that's one of the, I, like, I would wholeheartedly recommend you make your way over there and subscribe. It's taught me so much. Um, everything we've sort of discussed today, you know, like I said earlier, um, I've been an, I've been an avid fan for, I'd say, over three to four years now. And the channel's grown quite, like, quite a lot, actually, in recent times. It's doing amazing touch wood. I'm very happy for you. I'm glad this Thank you. conversation that you're championing is actually getting so much more widely accepted and getting so much traction. It's actually a really awesome thing. Me too. And I just have to say I'm so grateful for everyone who watches those videos because um, I, I hear, I've heard what you said about, like, oh, you just – it seems like I found like what I'm doing, but it was not a smooth path. Like, I, because, because over the years I was, just, I was trying to talk about this stuff and I didn't necessarily have the language, right? Like I was fumbling my way through the same as everyone else. And, and I would try to talk about it and people would just look at me like I was crazy. And like, it just, it seems to have like found the right thread on YouTube. Like I, it seems to be connecting and everyone who shows up is really great. And I love the feedback. So I'm really grateful for everyone who shows up because I think this this conversation is so important to me and I can't have it by myself. So everyone who shows up to the YouTube channel, like I so very much appreciate it. Yeah. I last couple of questions just leveraging off that place then is um the digital world is something that we're living more and more in now, Suki. And there is so much to be said, you know, we've we've discussed co regulation today and maybe we could have expanded on it further in terms of, you know, how we pick up on each other's states. But, you know, you mentioned your work with horses, so I think that is already in people's consciousness now. Um, that we actually pick up like nervous system states from each other. Um I do have some cu curiosities around does the most down-regulated win? Does the most up-regulated win <laughs> around each other? Um, maybe that's a question worth asking, but also the question it is. Was, okay, sorry. It yeah, is. Go. yeah, and then the I'll strongest ask the nervous system wins. The strongest nervous system wins. The one who maintains their regulation, what or their state, I should say, the one that ma maintains their state the strongest. So if yeah. you are very rooted in your nervous system, 
and you are in a good place with your nervous system, you are not easily shaken. If you're, if you don't self-regulate and you're pinging off everyone else all the time, it's exhausting. You're going to, you're going to take on everything that people have. And, and that doesn't mean you can't be in your nervous system state and connect to what other people uh, are feeling. Cause I think a lot of times people say like, Oh, I'm an empath. I feel everything. You can feel what other people, you can be very sensitive to the emotional state of other people and not be so pulled and swayed and kind of like going, you know, blown by the wind. So if you're mm. strong, you'll be nice and rooted. And that's so important for healers, right? Like right. if you are a healer, because people aren't coming to you because everything's going super great. They're mm. coming to you because they're not regulated. They're not doing well. Mm. <laughs> so you got to have that for yourself or it's exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to leave that out. That's question. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the digital space. What do you find are some of the traps um, in the digital space for how it just is a reality, right? Like there's so much more time that we're spending like I'm looking outside here and it's beautiful, lush nature and I'm very privileged to be able to touch wood, have this um, set up. But, you know, right here is a screen and lights and all this sort of stuff, um, which, you know, yeah, just has its challenges and limitations. But what is, yeah, what is your awareness of the impact that the digital nature of today's living has as an impact on our nervous systems? Mm, it's so vast. I mean, there's so much information coming at us. Um, I re- there's an author I really like. He's, I believe, a journalist, but he write, he's written some books called Oliver Berkman. Um, and he recently wrote a blog post that I really loved where he talked about how like the internet was supposed to basically solve the problem of information overload. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because- because it was supposed to filter out all of the noise, right? It was supposed to filter out all of the things that we didn't want to pay attention to. The problem isn't that we um, have a lot of stuff coming at us we don't want to pay attention to. It's like everything that comes towards me. Like I, the list of books I want to read that I get recommendations for is like I'm I, I'm so overwhelmed by it because it doesn't it's just, get it's shorter. Like, it only gets longer. Every day <laughs> someone is telling me about it, but I could read every a book every day for the rest of my life, and I probably wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah. catch up um and so he talks about you know that you have to think about it more like a river and less like a I, le- less like a hose or something like that I think but it, it, the idea is to think of it like a river that you're like reaching into and plucking something out of like choosing to take this and take that which I find really helpful because I think one of the traps is like we 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 want to engage with all the things that we're interested in because we all do <laughs> but then that there's just too much um and then I, I think just the the very physical structure of a screen being a certain size, even if you have a big screen, it's still just a certain size. And that does something to your to your vision, to your eyes. It makes your, you know, your movement of your eyes very small. Um, so making sure that you get outside and look long distances away, which relaxes the ciliary muscle of your eyes. It opens up your peripheral vision more. Um, we're designed as humans to scan the horizon. So, you know, making that a regular practice, even if you just do it at the end of your day. Uh, but if you've been in, in front of a screen all day, make sure you go look at things that are far away. Um, and then I think that people are very opinionated <laughs> online um, and overconfident a lot of times. And I, I really, that's something that I try to be mindful of for myself. I, I don't want to, to, I don't want to be that. So I hope that I never am. But like, I'm in groups a lot of times where people say, they, they make assertions that are maybe not always well-founded and they're making assertions that are not well-founded to people who are not well enough informed to know whether they're well-founded or not. And so there's just a lot of like talk and people kind of get steered in different directions um, that are maybe not the best. So I think, Mm. yeah. And so I think really considering sources and staying, being very careful about, you know, I don't want to steer people away from group support because groups are so communities are so important. And yet some of the, some of the forums where people exist online can become really toxic spaces. So just being mindful when you're engaging with those spaces, like who's talking and what kind of energy does it have and, and kind of considering the assertions and where they're coming from and how well-founded they are, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting dynamic and thank you so much for speaking to those points because, yeah, I find it 
you know, with your work and, and even my work, like being able to connect to like-minded, like-hearted people is, is such a blessing and a privilege from all over the world. Like if we were just standing on a soapbox in our village square, <laughs> we probably would only have connected to so many people. Um, oh, and it's completely. it's really rich and beautiful, you know. Um, yeah. But yet it also requires discernment. Yeah. 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 With all of the, uh, the opportunity that comes with that. Yeah. So, yeah, I can't let you go today without just, yeah, hearing, well, I can't say from the horse's mouth just because you've got a background with horses, can I? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) That is rude, Amrit. Be better. Okay, sorry. (laughs) But I can see the smile on your face. I got away with that one. I I got away with that one. (laughs) Um, (laughs) My apologies. I mean that in the most loving way. Um, The... The... Well, sort of coupling the mission that you're on and just the potential that you see for humanity. Usually I ask this question at the end is what is what do you see as the inspired evolution in the world for you? But I think specifically for you, Silky, um yeah, what's what do you see in the world if your mission of helping people be in greater regulation came true? Like what is a world of just more people regulated than not regulated potentially look like can you describe that future yeah i think we'd have less greed i think we'd have fewer i mean it's it sounds ridiculously lofty but i i see world peace because we wouldn't feel the need to take from each other we wouldn't feel the need to invade we wouldn't feel the need need to snip and fight like i'm thinking on a global level right like the things that are happening between countries which are driven by humans right we have all this like them us against them and you know, power hungry leaders and, and land grabs and resource grabs and argument about all kinds of stuff. And I think that if we had a lot of trauma healing and we could be more in relationship with ourselves and in relationship with our environment and our community, we'd have a healthier planet. Um, Because I think we would feel the pain of having a really, you know, very poorly treated earth. Um, I think that uh, wildlife would thrive because we would understand the need for ecosystems because we would see ourselves not apart from it, but as a part of it. And that the ecosystem is, is integral to us, not this thing that we live in like a house that we can just rebuild when we trash it. Um, And I think that there would be more human connection. I think that we would fight less across cultural lines. I think there'd be more intercultural understanding. And I really hope there'd be less war. Um, and I, I see it as a letting go more of, of a taking, you know, I don't, I don't see it as like more and more and more. I see it as like stripping away all the stuff that we've created that we don't need. I'm so grateful for you and your work in the world. Um, yeah, you have a massive fan at the very least of one. <laughs> in- <laughs> Well, thank me. you. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that actually it's not just one. There's half a million people already that are loving all the content that you put together on YouTube online. And I'm, yeah, just so grateful. Even, um, yeah, pain free at any age is such a gift to the world as well. So I'll put a link to it in the show notes below. But Suki, I could totally thank you for your time here today. And I definitely will. But also knowing, you know, just the, like 15 years of doing this work, facing the courage to put yourself online fucking the trend, your backgrounds of so much of like rolfing and all the physical stuff, which I know has its place in the world, um, but just your explorations and continuing to, yeah, just dive deeper and deeper um, so you can help yourself and then ultimately help others as well. I just fully acknowledge you and your journey and it's a lifetime's worth of work, I would say, that you've poured into into all of it and, you know, we get to stand on the shoulders and that com- of that in this conversation today. So thank you so much for you, really. Yeah, really appreciate you. You are so kind. Thank you. Inspired Evolution Tribe and audience, thank you so much for making it through to the end, the complete end of another episode. I just cannot believe how inspired to evolve you really are. And I can't tell you how much that means to me, to be your brother walking this path by your side. Now, if you loved this conversation, you absolutely will love the conversation that I had with Bruce Lipton on epigenetics, an incredibly profound conversation about healing and expressing your truest, most empowered self. Epigenetics, the father of epigenetics, Bruce Lipton, in this conversation, tune in here now.